Okay. So uh, let's start uh, Nila Zorovic's uh, second talk. Thanks. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so yesterday we talked about finite index rigidity. Uh, we mind you is the property that uh, there are no two finite index subgroups which are isomorphic but have different indices. And uh, we ended up uh, proving the, the theorem of, of Sikiotis. <clears throat> that uh, if G is infinite ended, then G is, uh, uh, is finite index rigid. And recall that the, our goal is, is to prove uh, the theorem that I mentioned. Yeah. Which is that if, Every non, -ele non elementary hyperbolic group is, uh, is finite index. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so what I'll do today is I'll start by reminding as all the definition of hyperbolic groups and, and maybe outlining um, the, the strategy because the strategy is really, I mean, not about finite index rigidity so much, but about this idea of volume versus complexity. And we'll see uh, how this comes into the thing, but just, just for now, I just wanted to add this observation since we have Sikiotis theorem, we actually don't have to prove it for all non-elementary hyperbolic groups. We just need to prove it for, for what? I mean, okay, so maybe some of you don't know what non-elementary means, but I said last time that this basically means they're not finite and not uh, virtually cyclic. Okay, that's the definition. So, uh, if they're infinite ended, we already know the effect. So actually what we have to show is that every one ended hyperbolic group is finite index region, finite index region, right? Because infinite ended is covered, two ended is exactly the thing that I ruled out. That's the elementary case. Zero ended is also elementary, so we're left with the one ended. Okay, so that this was, um, to use this uh, Sikiotis theorem. And, and we'll actually use the fact that it's one-ended at some point uh, tomorrow. Uh, yeah, but for now, let's, let's go back and define what are hyperbolic groups. So when I say hyperbolic group, I mean Gromov hyperbolic and it's definition by Gromov. So uh, say G is a generated group. <coughs> A is hyperbolic if the k graph of G with respect to some finite say by S is hyperbolic. Okay, that's not a definition, right? So what does it mean for this thing to be hyperbolic? So uh, what it means is that there exists some delta okay, such that for every three points in my space, it's called x for now, uh, the geodesic uh, triangle yeah. is delta. Uh, slim or thin or whatever. Um, and by this, I mean the following. So I take X, Y, and Z. So I point in X, I connect them with geodesics. So you can choose whatever geodesic you like, connecting them. This is the geodesic triangle I was talking about. And 
So let's just uh, mark this. So maybe let's mark the, the Jodasi X that even though it's not necessarily unique, I'll just use this notation. So uh, to be delta slim means that the uh, this geodesic, any one of the sides of the triangle is actually contained in the delta neighborhood of the other. Okay, so the cartoon is you take a delta neighborhood of, of this geodesic and the delta neighborhood of the other geodesic. And they should contain, you cannot see it, right? It's there. To contain the geodesic exit. Okay, so this, this is what it means to be, uh, for a geodesic metric space to be hyperbolic. And again, a, a group is hyperbolic if, it's, if, if one of its Cayley graphs, and therefore all of, all of its Cayley graphs will be hyperbolic. Okay, so this is the fact that, Right, so the fact does not depend, does not depend on, on the generating set. Yes. Questions so far? That's the negatively curved part of my talk, at least. When I say negatively, I mean this kind of stuff. Um, okay. So maybe examples. So we saw some space of free groups, trying to free groups, surface groups. Uh, hyperbolic. And more generally, you can take fundamental group of uh, negatively curved spaces, negatively curved, let's say, manifold, closed manifold, where negatively curved here means with a negative section of curvature. Okay. Um, more examples. Random groups. So, so what does it mean, a random group? You, I mean, there are several models. Uh, the more popular one is the, the density model. You fix a generating set, and then you, at random, pick uh, relations of length L, and you take L to infinity, okay? And with probability tending to one, those groups will be hyperbolic. Ah, I forgot to mention the very beginning. Finite groups. You notice a theme, right? That I keep forgetting finite groups because I hardly consider them to be groups. Okay, so finite groups are hyperbolic. I mean, this this sort of satisfied by trivial here, right? And and also cyclic, the cyclic group, or anything that's virtually cyclic. That's also hyperbolic. Can you see? Can you see that? Yeah. Um, and the, these are what I call elementary. Or not, not me. This is what's called elementary. So really, when people think of hyperbolic groups, they're not thinking of those. They're thinking of the rest of the list. Those are sort of elementary hyperbolic. They're not that interesting for us. Um, what else? Small cancellation groups. I don't know what they are, but so some, let's say C prime one six, or some, some condition of that. It's certain groups that are given by, by presentation that's nice enough in the sense that the relations don't overlap by much. Um, this was uh, extremely useful in combinatorial group theory. Right back and still. Um, 
Good. Anything else I should put on the list and I forgot? Help me. It's your favorite type of white group that I forgot. Um, so here is, here is another example. Um, uh, yeah, maybe let, let me just point out that maybe this theorem could be interpreted as like a generic group is finite index rigid because it, and by a generic group, I actually mean a random group. Uh, cheat way of selling selling the result, overselling the result. Okay, good. Um, a generic group is also one ended. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, so here is another example. So I did forget something that some of you like. Uh, but here is maybe, I mean, it's an example of a hyperbolic group and hence we'll get a corollary. So let me just write the corollary. So if you take uh, P to be a, an automorphism of the free group, auto automorphism, which is uh, at all level, meaning no power of phi sends an element back to the same conjugacy class, the same itself. Um, then, or let's say this is the setting. And now we form two free bicyclic groups in the following way. So you take F and you form the, the semi-direct product with phi. Okay, so this is one thing you can do. Is it clear what I mean when I write this? You have a cyclic group acting on F by phi. So we form the semi direct product. And let's say we form two such things. So we take the mth power of, of phi and you take the, I don't know, nth power of phi. And yeah, so the, the corollary would say if those are, they happen to be isomorphic, then, then in fact, it's the same thing. So, uh, so you chose the same powers. Okay. We just say that, um, yeah, let's, let's prove this. Prove this. Prove. The following group is hyperbolic. Who should I attribute this to? Help me. I didn't write the reference. Did I write? No, how? Greek? Greek man. Okay. Greek man. Good. Thanks. Yeah, this is a finite index subgroup of this group of index M. This is a finite index subgroup of index N. That's it, right? If they're isomorphic, they have the same index. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an if and only if, right? It's hyperbolic if and only if he is at one. Yeah, is it clear? The proof is clear. Radhika told me there's another proof. Maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, fine. So let, let's, let's put uh, maybe this theorem in, in some context. And maybe the, the context is a theorem of, uh, of Tzil Sela first. Says that um, one-ended hyperbolic groups are Kohopfian. One-ended hyperbolic groups are Kohopfian. 
does it mean i.e. Uh, there is no embedding of the group into itself, no proper proper embedding. into itself, or in other words, G is not isomorphic to any subgroup of itself, right? uh, So you see, this, this already implies that you cannot have a, an index one, meaning G subgroup, be isomorphic to an index, some finite, other finite index subgroup. Actually, it says more, it cannot be isomorphic to any, any other subgroup. Um, Okay. Is, is it clear how is it related to the theorem? No, is that a yes or no? No, okay, good. So this, this tells you that G cannot be isomorphic. G is not isomorphic to any proper subgroup of G. So in particular, if you think of G as the index one subgroup of the finite index, but actually any other subgroup of itself. Right? So this is kind of rigidity, but rigidity just for, for G itself. And, and it was a question of, uh, of white, whether in, in this setting of a one that did, hyperbolic group, um, a finite index subgroup can be isomorphic to an infinite index subgroup, okay? And, and this turns out to be uh, to be possible. So here's the example. It's an example of a hyperbolic group with a isomorphic finite index and infinite index subgroup. There exists G hyperbolic and two subgroups, the H1, H2 in G, which are isomorphic, but, but have different indices. Okay, so it, it doesn't contradict the theorem because one of those things is in. And let me. Let me draw this example. It's a very beautiful, easy uh, thing once you know the group, which is always the hard thing in, uh, in math. So, so here is the group. The group is, yeah, sorry. F2, yeah, maybe I should have, I mean, why, why this, this is there? Yeah, that's true. So, ah, yeah. I forgot the assumption, right? That's an important assumption. So yeah, as, as Mahan says, without this assumption, this is a triviality because you can take G to be the free group, okay? And then a finite index subgroup of, of G would be some free group of some rank. And, but you can find another free group inside G with, of, of infinite index, okay? Just randomly take K elements, you should generate something of this rank. Okay, so I mean, yeah, so the difficulty is really finding something that's one ended. And also, Seller's theorem is not true without the one ended assumption, exactly for that reason. The free group is isomorphic to, a, to some infinite index subgroups of, of itself. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so the, the group is the following so it's a, what's called a surface amalgam. Uh, you take the following space, you take the surface, the one whole uh, torus, okay? And you attach two more copies of this to itself. Okay, along the, same, along the same curve. So it's no longer a surface, but it's still hyperbolic. And, and here are the, the subgroups. Right, so subgroups correspond to, to covers. So one of them, this uh, finite, finite index 
a group should be a finite index cover. So yeah, here it is. You take um, you take a double cover of this guy, which opens this loop to a loop of length two. Okay, so you do it for each one of them. Okay, so this is a double cover. <clears throat> okay, this is on the one hand. On the other hand, you can do a similar thing, but, uh, but not in the same way, sort of. Okay, so how, how do you do a similar thing, but not in the same way? So maybe let's color them. This is orange, then this would be the orange sign. This is, can you see green? Okay. okay. So here is another possible cover. You take, take the orange, you open it along this curve, for instance. This will give you two, two boundary components. Okay, so this would be orange. Yeah, you do the same for the white and green. <clears throat> okay, I'm still drawing, I'm, I will draw a finite index subgroup. Uh, so here, I'll just close it with the green part and the white part. And here I have to close it with a orange and green. So on. So if you get the middle part, then the sorry? The the the, the one is too bad. Yeah, this one. This is a this is a double cover of this this guy, but the one that doesn't increase this length but actually doubles it. So for example, you can cut it on this and glue two copies of itself. Hmm? Yeah, this, this is just a two cover where you open, open the middle. Hmm? No, it doesn't. Yeah, I think the other cover is the other one. But uh, make, uh, I don't know, maybe take more genus aside. There's something that should work. Good. Uh, so those are two finite index uh, covers, but, but note that you have an embedding of this guy into here. You see it? It's the green and white, green and say white. See it? So this actually is isomorphic to an infinite index subgroup of, of this guy, given by this. Beautiful, right? Okay. So, so again, you can, whoops. the more general version of Sellers theorem is, is false. You can have a finite index subgroup that's isomorphic to an infinite index subgroup, but somehow, you cannot have both of them have finite index. Or if they do, then they have to have the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not a mega because it splits. There is a cut. There is a cut pair, and I think they conjecture that that's sort of the only the only way. I I also believe this. Somehow. The only way you can do it is if G was. Uh, Virtually, let's say, splits over Z. Okay, we, we can talk about this. Good. Um, 
Hmm? Yes. So let's let's talk about um, the actual theorem that's behind this finite index rigidity, which is, as I mentioned, the relation between volume and, and complexity. <clears throat> so let me let me first demonstrate it for for surfaces. Go back a step to it for surfaces. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so, so here's, here's the idea. If you have, if sigma is you now a, a hyperbolic surface, by which I mean it's given with a, with a Riemannian metric of constant curvature minus one. <laughs> then we have the uh, gauss bonnet Uh, theorem that tells us um, that the volume of the surface is minus minus the uh, what am I missing? A pi, a two pi. Help me. I was somehow never able to remember if it's pi or two pi. Okay. Hmm? Two pi, good. Okay. <clears throat> so it gives you that. So you have volume on the left hand side, volume. And on the right hand side, you have, well, okay, some two pi. Now you understand why I don't care about the two pi so much. What I care about is, is this, which is some measurement of the complexity of the surface, right? In, in the solar characteristic, we see the genus or the... the sorry? Yes, exactly. Two pi is equal to one. It's good. Uh, yeah, you, you've been around physicists long enough. <laughs> Okay, so this is some measurement. I'll just call it measurement of complexity. It, it tells you how, how complicated the surface is topologically, right? I mean, this is just two minus two G, right? Where G is the genus of the surface. So, and the, the genus captures all of the information of the topology of the closed, closed surface, right? So, I mean, in this case, it's a, it's a very good measurement of complexity because it tells you everything you need to know about the surface. Right? But it's some, some topological complexity of, of the surface. Uh, in particular, it's, I mean, it's uh, directly related to, say, the rank of the I1 of the, of the surface. So genus, which is, I mean, okay, the rank is just twice the genus. Good. Um, so let's let's rephrase let's rephrase this uh, uh, formula in the following way. Well, instead of thinking of the surface with some hyperbolic metric, we can think of how the pi one of the surface acts on its universal cover, which we can identify with the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so uh, equivalently. Uh, gamma is some subgroup of the, or acts, let's say, acts on H2, freely and co-compactly in this case, freely and co-compactly, right? The surface, if you want, is H2 mod gamma. And now we can talk about the volume of H2 mod gamma, as I said, this is the surface, is equal to minus two pi, the Euler characteristic of the surface, which I mentioned yesterday is the Euler characteristic of the fundamental group.
Okay, so why, why did I want to phrase it in this way? Because here we see what's really behind this thing. We have a space on which we act. Okay, some space X that is fixed in the context of, of this theorem. And what we have is different groups that act on this, okay, gamma. And we have this formula that relates the co-volume of, of this group, or the volume of the quotient, to some complexity of the group that's acting. Okay, and there are some constants here that depend on the space, right? If I would just take H2 and change its metric a bit, the volume would change and will somehow show up in this formula. But still, you'll have this relation between volume and the complexity of the. And yeah, and this is sort of a theme of, of many, many results, mostly. In the, in the smooth setting of, of manifolds. So let me just mention a few of them. <clears throat> yeah. So in all of what I'm about to, to phrase, or almost all of the the results, the space X is sort of fixed for the discussion. And what you're interested in is the relation between the co-volume of a, of a lattice, something that acts, let's say, freely and co-compactly, or it could be a lattice more generally, and some, some measurement of complexity. And when I say some measurement of, of complexity, it doesn't have to be the Euler characters. It could be the rank, okay? meaning the, I mean, here rank might, might have a double meaning, but rank here meant minimal number of generators. Or it could be other, other forms of complexity. So let's, uh, let's, let's see some, some of those uh, uh, connections. And maybe before we do that, some, some caution is needed. Okay? So for instance, if we try to do it in H3, and try to relate volume and say rank, that's not working anymore. So let's just see this example. It's actually related to what I just raised here. Um, so if X is H3, uh, there are two things that might go wrong. One, one of them is you can have, uh, you can have a, a hyperbolic three manifold, cross hyperbolic, Manifold that fibers over the circle, in which case the fundamental group of, of this three manifold will be uh, of the form I1 of, a, of the fiber surface, semi direct product with Z. <clears throat> okay, and now note that I can find more such things by, by looking at. Uh, let's call it gamma gamma n would be the index n subgroup that we considered before. Okay, if you think this this acts on the surface by some pseudonosov, this is like taking the nth power of this one. So. Okay, so this is now a sub subgroup of this guy. <clears throat> okay, so there exists as I, I didn't really say what. There, but there exist such examples. And what we can see here immediately is that the rank of gamma is at most twice the genus plus one, right? The rank of gamma n is also at most 2g, 2G, 2G plus one. So rank of gamma or gamma n is at most 2g plus one, but the volume of H3 on gamma n behaves like n, or it's the volume of this times n. Right? Because these are just covers of the same hyperbolic three many. Okay, so, so we don't get this nice relation between volume and, and this measure, measure of complexity. When? It's because the other characteristic is zero. 
No, okay, but forget about oil. Like, I mean, there are other measurements of complexity. So this is one. I mean, here I could have phrased it, volume of sigma is roughly the same as the rank or it grows like the rank. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay, but so this, this is on the one hand, there's, there's another problem with uh, three manifolds. Again, take three manifolds. Um, yeah, what, what did I want to, ah. Yeah, uh, so another problem might be the following. So take, start with some hyperbolic three manifold, which is cusps. And Thurston tells us you can uh, do a damp filling on the cusp and get a closed hyperbolic three manifold of volume less than this volume. Okay? And you can do it for, so from this, you can produce this is Thurston, some sequence of, of hyperbolic three manifolds, Mn, okay, which are closed now, closed hyperbolic three manifolds. They are non isomorphic, they are different uh, three manifolds, but all have volume of Mn is bounded by the volume of, of M. Okay, so this means that in terms of, of complexity, there's, there's a limit to what we, what we can do, right? In the surface case, this kind of uh, complexity that, that we find describe the surface completely, here it will not be possible because if there is such a thing, uh, there'll be infinitely many different things that would have sort of the bounded complexity. Um, okay, so that's an issue. And maybe one, one of the results that, that I wanted to mention is, uh, result of Cooper that tells us that the volume of, in, in, this, in this case, H3 mod gamma <clears throat> bounds from below the, um, the T invariant of, of gamma. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll, define, I'll define what this is, but again, this is some measurement of complexity. So what, what is this T, T gamma? It's sort of the next thing you can do. So rank measures how many, how many generators you need. So T, the Zan T environment measures how much relations you need. Okay, so in what sense? So in one of the following equivalent sense. So one of them is, um, you, you, write, you write gamma uh, as generators and relators. <clears throat> and you ask all the relators to be of length at most three. So you can always do that. If your group is finally presented, you can find a presentation where all the relations have length most three. And then you count how many of them have length three, actually. Let, let me just put the quality, even though it's not, that's not precise, but yeah, you're just counting how many, how many of the relations have length. Um, okay, another way of, of phrasing it, which is I think how Cooper phrased it in, the, in his paper. <laughs> is you look at, oops. Uh, you look at any presentation Now you, you do not restrict the presentations to have relations of length three, but you count uh, the length of the relation maybe minus two.
Okay, and it should be clear what's the relation between the two. If you have, if you have a relation, you can just chop it right bigger. Should I rewrite this bigger? Yes. So basically, you take the length of the relation minus two. That's the, you can't forget about this. So, yeah, what's the relation? If you, if, you take, if you take this presentation, you have relators which are long, you can chop them up to relators of length three, and the, the amount of relator, new relators is just... Okay, so this is another measurement of complexity, and we see that in this case, it is bounded from below by the by the volume, by result. And we know already that it's impossible to bound it from above, right? Because of, because of this. Maybe I should say, if you have different finely presented groups, a sequence of different finely presented groups, the, the T invariant will go to infinity. Right? Because there's just finely many groups you can, you can write with, uh, whose T invariant is of a given size. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, so this is, this is actually one of the, I would say really the, the, the only results I've seen that bounds complexity uh, from below by the volume. Okay, most, most results are, you want to bound the complexity of gamma uh, from above by the volume. And they, I mean, there's a, an, abundance of, an abundance of such things. Um, maybe let me just mention a few. So, uh, so Gromo proved that Betty numbers, uh, yeah, so, okay. Betty number. So again, some measurement of complexity, in this case, the rank of the, of the homologies are, are bounded from above by the volume, let's say in this setting of HN. Um, it's more general, uh, more general, non, non Sorry, negatively curved manifold. Uh, this means up to a constant for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And similar thing we have. Uh, maybe let, let me mention uh, Yolanda, yeah, Bader, Yolanda. Sauer. That I mean, if this takes care of the the free part of the homology, they take care of the torsion. So here you need to assume n is not three because of the issues that are, that happen in n, n equals three, and then you have log of the, the torsion part of the homologies. is bounded by by the volume. And um, yeah, you have similar results for rank in so Gelander and uh, Belolipetsky, Gelander, Ubotsky, Shalev um, do a similar thing for rank of lattices in, I think I'm missing assumptions here. Uh, so it's connected semi-simple groups without compact factors, but, uh, but this, ah, maybe this is fine. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, so here, this was the, if you want the, the symmetric space of, oh, what I just said, semi-simple B groups with, without compact factors. Um, 
And what else? More of these. I mean, maybe I should mention uh, Gomov and Gomov and Thurston proving the volume. So in the in the hyperbolic case, volume is the same as initial volume, which is kind of related. Another measurement of complexity, but this is more topological and less algebraic. Okay. Yeah. So what's what's our goal? <clears throat> So we saw yesterday that sort of the, the way to prove finite index rigidity was for each group or each subgroup of a, of a given group, you want to associate some numerical value, right? That is multiplicative in the index. Uh, and uh, the value depends on the, on, the, uh, on the group itself, right? On the isomorphism class of the group. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so here the, the strategy is you should think of the index as represented by volume. Okay. We'll say exactly how to see that later. And the sort of numerical value that we want is, is this measurement of complexity. Okay. And our goal would be just to, to find such a measurement of complexity for hyperbolic groups that, that works, that works we will not get such nice inequalities, but maybe some uh, something like that. Okay. So here's the, here's the idea. <clears throat> so now we, this was maybe the smooth setting and now we go back to the discrete setting. Discrete setting. Okay, so I take X to be now a, not a manifold anymore, but a simply shell complex thing. And let's just define volume of, uh, volume of X, maybe it's a finite simply shell complex. So I'll define volume of X to just be the number of cells, all dimensions, number of cells or synthesis. Okay, and we can also define a similar thing for the I cells, right? Of dimension. or of the I skeleton. Good, so this, this will be now my notion of, of volume when I think of actions on a simplicial complex. <clears throat> and the next thing I need is some notion of complexity, which we look very similar to this. So here it is, but I mean, just note before one, this depends on X, right? It's volume of X, number of cells in X. The next thing I'm gonna define is something that depends on a group. So I'm given a group G and let's assume, let's assume, uh, you know what, that's before, before I assume anything. <laughs> Yeah, so take some simplicial complex, denoted K, simplicial complex, and yeah, of say dimension uh, N. Is that what I want? N of N plus N, such that, so I want I one of, how do I want to phrase it? Um, okay, 
phi one of a bar to be to be g. Okay, so it's phi one is g, but I, I want it to be a good represent topological representation of of the group g up to this dimension uh, m. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the the homotopy groups of a bar are zero up to dimension n minus. Okay. And now define, so here's the definition. The definition is C i m g, where i is some number less than s or equal to m, is just the volume, the minimal volume of such a thing. What do you have such a k? What, sorry? When do you have such a k? When do I have such a k? Okay, so I have such a k if G is of type Fm. That's the, by definition. <laughs> if, I mean, such a thing that is, that is finite, right? That's the, uh, but so far, I mean, this could be infinite and then the complexity could be infinite, right? Uh, okay, as above. Okay. So you see the, the, the two definitions seem very, very close, right? You are measuring volumes of things and here we're minimizing over volumes that depend on group G. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's just see that we, we understand the second definition because it's I think more complicated. The CIM. Ah, yes, it's the height volume. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, okay. The thing is, I was lying here a bit. So maybe what I want to take. Yeah, because I, I also want to allow M to be, to be one, and then this is not the right thing. So let me change this, I apologize. To take A to be a simplicial complex, I mentioned M, with a free, free action, G on K. Okay, so instead of looking at K bar, I'm looking at, at its universal cover, which is better. <laughs> okay, so this automatically tells me that the pi one of the quotient would be G. I don't need this. And I want K uh, to be um, M minus one connected, meaning all of its homotopy groups up to dimension M minus one are trivial. And The, the difference between the two definitions is the first time I just look at the quotient and the second time I looked at the space and not the quotient. Yeah, so, so let's see that we are following, following this definition. So what is C11? And then what is C22? So C11, I'm looking for a space, okay? In this case, a graph, okay? Which is zero connected, meaning connected, okay? And the group acts freely on this thing. And I'm trying to minimize how many orbits of edges I see in this thing. So what is that really? I mean, maybe not on the nose, but morally, what? D as in the rank of the rank of D, yeah, D of G. Yeah. So C11 is just basically getting the rank back. 
Now you can guess what C22 is. <laughs> Right, I'm looking for a two-dimensional complex, which is one connected, meaning simply connected, uh, on which G acts freely. And uh, I'm counting how many two cells, and note that this, this is a simplicial complex. So it's actually like counting how many triangles I see in a presentation. Where is it? Yeah, so as I'm count, counting C, it's C22. Two, two. You're counting relations, yeah. Counting relations? Yeah, counting generally. Ah, okay. Or, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, I should assume here maybe G is, G is one and it is. You don't want to have generators that are not related to relators and then, then you're fine. It's, it's the same. I mean, it, you have you have more relators than you have more relators than generators usually, right? If it's one and then or doesn't split it doesn't have a free part. Yeah. Good. So here is the here is the theorem that we'll prove uh, tomorrow and the next day. So I have X is now some hyperbolic one-ended graph. Okay, this is the, the, the big space that is fixed. Okay, like the H2. And what I'm varying is the groups that act on it. Right? And so the theorem would tell us that, um, yeah, so for every G acting on X, Freely and co-compactly. <clears throat> then the ah, there exists M. Sorry. There exists M. Yeah, good. So that the two M complexity of G behaves like so up to uh, bounding it from below and above by. Uh, linear functions of the volume. Okay, so here again, what, what do I mean by, by this? I just take the quotient graph, I treat it as a simplicial graph and measure how many uh, edges and vertices I see there. Yeah. Sorry? C, you're asking if this is this should be one? This is two. No, but this is this is not in X, this is for G. So I, I mean, yeah, I, I take here. I mean the fact that X is a graph is not that important. You can put here a simplicial complex. That's not. That's not the issue, right? Because here you're counting something. It doesn't even matter what you count, count whatever cells you like. In there. But, but what's important is in G, you want to count relations. But not just, not just C22, which I mean would be a better theorem and maybe open. Yeah, so the other side of, of this inequality is impossible, right? By, yes. by this. Yeah. But in the discrete setting, so that's, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so in the discrete setting, one of those inequalities, namely the volume bounds from above this complexity is trivial. And we'll see this in, I think, on uh, Friday. Um, and, and really the, the theorem is the other inequality. So something in the form of what Cooper proves. But, but this is very specific to the discrete setting. I mean, the discrete setting, the, the inequality that most of those people look at is trivial, which is definitely not, as you can see by the list of 
uh, authors there. Not trivial in the in the smooth set. Okay. Um, yeah. So now let's pop up pam eraser. I mean, I want to now get from this will prove tomorrow and on Friday. And what I want to do in the last 15 minutes is go from this to finite index with GDP. <clears throat> so maybe as a first easy corollary, we already get very close to, to the finite index rigidity. And that's the following corollary. If now I have G, some one ended hyperbolic group, and H, the subgroup of finite index subgroup, <laughs> then uh, the complexity of H is basically its index. Okay, what's the proof here? Yeah, what, what is the proof? Means up to constant or yeah, up to constant. Yeah, maybe I should. Yeah, then thanks. So this means up, up to constant that depends on x. So this is why I'm stressing all the time x for me is fixed in whatever theorem I'm thinking of, and what I'm changing is the. the group. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is general. So this is something that depends on x here, it will be something that depends on g. But not an H. Right, that's the yeah, multiplicative. From below and uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what's the proof? We just need to find this hyperbolic one of the graph on which we can apply the theorem. And what? Yeah, just take the Cayley graph. G. So take X to be the Cayley graph of G with respect to some generating sets, right? This is by, by the assumption hyperbolic and one-ended, right? And, and now you have every finite index subgroup of G will act on X freely and co-compactly, right? The co-compactly is exactly the index. And this volume, yeah, sorry, freely and co-compactly, Yeah, and by, and by this theorem, we get that C2M of H, right, that's the group that's acting, is the same as the volume of X mod H. And this is very, very easy to see that this is basically the index, right? I mean, the number of vertices is really the index and number of edges is some of the so. Yeah, so this is, we prove that the corollary from the theorem and yeah yes m m will be the dimension of the boundary of of the hyperbolic space we get to this on friday this is by hmm? this is by this is, oh, yeah. this is not yet the corollary is not yet finite integrity if the, the if there was equality here then we'll be done, right? Because this, I mean, so let, let's, let's go over this quickly. If there was equality and not just uh, those inequal, annoying inequalities, up to, a con up to a constant that varies, I mean, on G, but it doesn't vary on A, so that's not that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this means, yeah, good. This means this and this. Two constants. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So if this was an equality, then we'll be done with the finite index rigidity because as I said this is, this is something that depends only on H, on the isomorphism type of H. And this is, um, well, this is the index, and we get, I mean, we, we saw such proofs. <clears throat> um, good. So, so what we actually need here is some kind of a, I don't know, bootstrapping argument, take this, 
this weaker inequalities and sort of use them to, to get what we want. And, and this is the last, uh, the last part of, of this talk is just tuning. So, uh, so the corollary implies finite index mediality. Yeah, so, so assume that okay, G is some one and the hyperbolic group. And I have two isomorphic finite index subgroups. Finite index. And let's assume that they have different intercepts. Okay, so this is some minor alpha is less than. Yeah. So, um, so what can we do? So the first step is to show that once you have such a non non uh, index rigid case, you can actually find A's and B's with where the, the ratio of the indices could be arbitrarily big. Okay, so this is the key part of this uh, bootstrapping argument. <coughs> so let's let's do that. So I have this isomorphism between A and B. Okay, they sit inside G. Or maybe let's do this in a different color. Is this a different color? Something. Yeah, so what I would like to do is I would like to take powers of phi. The issue is one cannot really compose phi with itself because it has a different domain and, and range, right? Um, yeah, so, but, but you can compose it with itself on some smaller subgroup. And this is exactly what we'll do. You can consider A intersection B in the middle, okay? And now, B is defined on phi inverse of A intersection B. Let's call it maybe A, uh, A2. So here I have phi like there. And I can apply, apply phi another time on this intersection and go to whatever the group here, phi of right, maybe let's call it B1. Yeah. Are we happy with this picture? Good. Let's let's look at the indices that we see here. So here there is some some index. Or let's let's put it here. Okay. There's some index. Let's call it B beta. Uh, if this was one, this would be two, I guess. Beta two. Note that this phi is an isomorphism. So this should have the same index. Okay. And here I have another index, you know, alpha one, which again is an isomorphism, the same index there. What else do we know? We know that uh, when I multiply alpha and beta two, I, I get the same as beta times alpha one. Yeah. And what else do I know? Uh, okay, this, this is already enough to, is, why did I call it alpha one? Yeah. No, one no one stopped me from doing it. Capital. Ah. Thanks. Yeah, so this is, I can think of them as being A1 and B1. Great. Yeah, so what I wanted to deduce from this is that, uh, remember that beta is bigger than alpha, so beta two must be bigger than alpha two. So this is still, still preserve this inequality, which is good. 
Another thing which we see here is since this is just an intersection, alpha two is smaller than alpha one and beta two is smaller than beta one. So alpha two is smaller than or equal to alpha one and beta two. Yeah, so what we get is, uh, and we can continue this. Okay, so the next thing is that I'll take this intersection and I'll have be able to define the composition of three things, so on, and get a sequence A1, A2, A3, etc. B1, B2, B3, etc. Yeah. And, and what do we get? We get that AN is isomorphic to Bn by phi to the n. And we get something about the indices. So if you look at it, the, the, index, the index of a n is, well, it's the multiplication of a1, a2, a3, et cetera. And b n is beta one, beta two. So the index of, uh, let's say b n over the index of a n is this multiplication of indices. And this goes to infinity, right? Because each one of them is bigger than, than this. It's some kind of an exponential thing. And it stabilizes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, at some point, I want to say is at some point those things stabilize because they, they can only get smaller. And when they stabilize, it's still beta and is bigger than alpha. And so this is an exponential point. Okay, so, so we got what we wanted. There are, there are subgroups which are isomorphic and the ratio of their indices is as large as we want. And this is really the end of the proof. So, so choose um, um, yeah. So say by the corollary, there exists some constants, uh, mu one and mu two, such that we have these inequalities. Okay, and then choose A and B, which are isomorphic, such that the, this difference is bigger than, than this difference, than this equation. Uh, okay. Yeah, and then what do we get? So let's, let's do the inequalities and see the contradiction. So on the one hand, A and B are isomorphic, so they have the same C2M. This is because they're isomorphic. And this is bounded by U2 of the index of B. And U1 index of A. But this assumption tells us that this is impossible. Okay, so yeah, good time to stop. So let me just say tomorrow and on Friday, what we'll focus is just on this theorem. We'll see what goes into the proof of this. Thanks. Questions? Am I going to talk about C2M or? Angles in a presentation. I mean, I can talk about the triangular presentation. So there'll be, 
the two aspects of the thing. I mean, we'll see that in, I mean, okay, as I said, one of the inequalities is sort of trivial, ignore it. The, the other inequality will prove actually two inequalities. There will be something in the middle. And for one of those inequalities, you, you're really looking at, uh, I wouldn't say triangles in the presentation, but really triangles in the, in the simplicial complex, right? And, and the other part would, would have to use M. I, I, I don't know how to take M away. And maybe this, this is open, like is TG uh, comparable to the volume? I, I don't know the answer to that. Ah, you're asking, yeah, so so in general, no. I mean, you can have groups which which don't have, whose complexity, whose M complexity is infinite. They don't have any finite such thing. So in general, it's, it's possible. In in this case of hyperbolic groups, hyperbolic groups are, are known to have uh, finite such things for every M. So they're... Yeah, so the, the obvious inequality is exactly what, what you say, what you said. You can take X and replace it by what's called the Rips complex. We'll talk about it. The Rips complex is, is nice, yeah. Or, I mean, okay, maybe a variant of the Rips complex if you really... X is the, ah, of course. Yeah, this is could be there in the in. Yeah, no, it's there. It's fine. Despite the fact that X free and so compact, you know that X must be locally fine. 